Well, hello there. Welcome to the New Look vlog for 2023. It's been a busy few months, and over the last year, I've kind of barely recording anything. I want to change that, so rather than work on kind of big plans and projects that kind of never come to fruition, I'm going to instead record what I've been up to each week, both at work, at university, at home, and on open source projects, and we'll kind of work this out as we go along. Uh, so this year's vlog is going to be a little bit of everything. Be sure to subscribe and like and comment on each video so I know what you want more or less of a particular topic. And please do suggest questions or topics for me to cover next. So to start, let's recap with what I've been doing whilst I've not been vlogging. So uh, on my day job, I've moved from VMware, where I came into VMware from the Pivotal acquisition, Pivotal being an agile software development company. Uh, and I've been advising government about deploying software to Kubernetes uh, and are now working instead for Datavid as the Director of Product and Sales Engineering, which is a grand title, which basically means we're in charge of new software product development rather than the consulting side, which is a kind of great place to be. Uh, there'll be more on the achievement of building a product team and launching a new software product market in the company blog, so I'm not going to spoil that, um, but I'll link to that from here when it's published, so do watch out for that. Uh, moving to Datavid has allowed me to take a day off a week, so I can use that for my academic studies too, which is brilliant. Uh, and I've been able to reconnect with some great people that I used to work with at MacLogic back in kind of 2012 to 2017 as well, which has been great. Um, speaking of studying though, I've started my second year on a part-time DPhil in clinical medicine at Oxford University. Uh, if you're not familiar with the term, DPhil is kind of Oxford ease for a PhD. Um, <clears throat> something like two thirds of people at Oxford are working in medicine, which is kind of a crazy statistic and it's something I certainly didn't know uh, before I joined. Um, a DPhil will normally take three to four years full time, but because I'm part time, mine's going to take anywhere from five to seven years. So. Uh, yeah, we're probably going to have uh, avoiding autistic burnout as another topic for this vlog as well. Um, clinical medicine, too, is a bit of a catch-all term at Oxford. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I'm concentrating personally on what might be called computational epidemiology or statistical modelling. So my topic is about using consumer devices, so mobile phones and wearables, to help prevent the spread of diseases. Uh, where this came from was it kind of came out of work I did during 2020 as the lead architect for the original UK COVID-19 app. Um, our group at Oxford is still involved with the COVID-19 apps and digital contact tracing too, although you know the UK app stuff is handled by others in the team, not me, because I can't be on both the side that helped to create you know the older version of the app, uh, as well as the side measuring the effectiveness. There needs to be kind of an ethical wall there. Um, but completely separate from that work and before I started Oxford, I, I kind of launched the open source Herald project as a kind of open source layer originally for digital contact tracing, um, but also for other apps, including emergency disaster communications is something we're looking at and also personal healthcare apps. So you can control your healthcare data and be very careful about who you give access to. I'm um, actually pushing out version 2.1 this weekend, much, much delayed because there's been lots of testing, lots of new stuff in there. Um, it's got better battery life, has more reliability and has the first kind of alpha implementation of a fully distributed messaging system um, which could be used, well we're using it initially for emergency communications so when like the internet goes down or the power goes down but you've got kind of mobile phones and masts around um, but it can also eventually be used for a fully distributed digital contact tracing system so that's, that's why that's being built in there um, but the project, you know, is keeps going and keeps growing um, and keeps improving, which is great. Um, it's been used in Australia's COVID-19 app and in Alberta, Canada's COVID-19 app. And it's been used by over kind of 7.6 million people, which is kind of amazing when you think about it. Um, Herald is also used by uh, an application called Operation Outbreak, which is a great kind of STEM outreach app in the northeast in the United States. So I'll post a link to their site and their great intro video, which is great fun in the description. So definitely check that out. Uh, but yeah, basically all this pandemic work I did in my day job and in the open source community during 2020 to 2021 uh, culminated in me wanting to do my PhD at the intersection of kind of computer science and healthcare. Whereas before the pandemic, I was considering doing my PhD on kind of graph databases and graph theory, which is totally different, like pure computer science. Um, but then working on the healthcare app, I realized that there's quite a lot of benefit to humanity if we actually do that. Uh, so I approached kind of Professor Christoph Fraser at Oxford, who I kind of knew from working on the COVID-19 app in the UK, to ask about where I could do a PhD in the UK. 
uh, and he suggested I apply to Oxford, uh, given that I wanted to continue on, on pandemic sciences work. And it's a great it's a great suggestion, as it turns out. Uh, apparently, they do take the sons of steel workers. Uh, who knew? <laughs> I mean, I absolutely love it. There, it's like finding a home for kind of your brain and your thoughts, which is if that makes any sense. Um, the group we're in, the Pathogen Dynamics Group, which is part of the Big Data Institute, is full of really amazing people doing great things. Um, and it's a privilege to be part of that group. Uh, Oxford too has launched a new Pandemic Sciences Institute, which our group's going to be one part of. So that's really exciting to watch develop over the next three years or so. I think most people doing their DPhils there will be graduated before that building's built, but because I'm part-time, I'll be there. So uh, hopefully that means I get a good desk somewhere. <laughs> um, but as they build the new institute, uh, we'll eventually co-locate our research group with the other kind of pandemic related ones around kind of vaccine development, primary healthcare delivery um, around pandemics as well. So uh, that's super exciting. And as we can tell from the last three years, kind of necessary long term for humanity as well. Um, incidentally, if you've not read the book Vaxxers by uh, Dame Professor Sarah Gilbert and Dr. Catherine Green, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's totally accessible for non-scientists uh, and it does pull back the covers of how Kind of long-term research is conducted i think you know when you hear about all oh, research has been done in the press it can you know be a bit confusing as to why different stories contradict each other but you know books like that really kind of open up the kind of scientific process which is which is great um but i'll put a link to the that book in the description uh of this video as well uh, being somebody who's been in the industry for 20 years uh, in IT and going back into academia has taken some adjusting, <laughs> as I think everybody at Oxford will have a good giggle at. Um, and I'm kind of the only person in the group that's been in the industry for, for that length of time, especially in, in IT rather than as a doctor doctor. Um, so it's great to be able to kind of share my experiences from industry and it's also great to learn loads about how primary research is done that will help real people. Um, so that's been good. Uh, I keep having to remind myself that I only get credit for primary research there. I don't get credit for any code I write as part of the DPhil. Um, so any code I write as part of the process, I don't get any credit for. So as somebody who's been building software solutions for 20 years, it's a bit of a shock to the system, but I I'm kind of getting over it. Uh, I'm getting better at kind of writing up my work as I go and writing up things, you know, conducting it as if, you know, this is the question I need to answer and, and ready to be published in a paper, which is great. Um, <clears throat> but Oxford itself is also an amazing city. I'm obviously not there at the moment. Um, I'm kind of spending my time, splitting my time between there and up here in, in uh, Derbyshire. Uh, but Oxford's an amazing city. There's loads to do there. There's great scenery in, both in the city and nearby, not to mention fantastic Harry Potter shops uh, because a lot of the films were filmed there, like in Christchurch College, for example. Uh, and one of my friends, or one of my best friend's kids is benefiting from this because every time I go to a high pot shop I just can't resist buying cool things but you can't really buy lots of cool high pot stuff for yourself so she's getting loads of <laughs> the stuff I keep buying. Um, but there's also loads to do in Oxford as well so there's great groups in town and these are now starting back up again post pandemic. So the Oxford Geek Night um, I went to recently, got invited by one of my colleagues in the research group and that was fantastic. Lots, not just kind of computational but environmental stuff um as well so that was super interesting to go along to and i also went to the first meeting of the femtech society at oxford uh, because their meeting was at my college and because a lot of their great ideas were around healthcare but don't worry i didn't go there and kind of mansplain everything um but i was very keen to support them as i think it's a great idea for society we do need you know solutions more tailored to women uh, so I, w I wanted to go and make sure uh, that they knew I was around and could help out if needs be and put them into contact with you know female leaders in the industry as well which is fantastic uh, but it's a great thing the Femtech Society there's lots of amazing kind of postgraduate student women there with great ideas for startups in Femtech um, that will come out of Oxford in the next few years so that's fantastic to see so if you'd like to hear about Oxford uh, and what we get up to at Oxford in the vlogs and of course it's best college which is St Peter's College which is mine <laughs> then then do let me know in the comments as well. Um, for my DPhil itself though what I'm currently working on is kind of the epidemiology can't even say it <sighs> epidemiological mathematical simulation models around COVID-19 at the moment so I'm looking at workplace dynamics 
Um, so rather than just look at the whole nation, the whole population level, I'm kind of looking at individual workplaces and, you know, depending on the type of work and how much contact they have, it does it make sense to kind of introduce different controls in different places rather than lock everybody down. So that's kind of stuff I'm looking at at the moment. Um, <clears throat> the last month or so, I've been looking at a way to more accurately determine the kind of basic reproduction uh, rate of a new disease in the early phases of an outbreak. Uh, so that you can more accurately predict its impact. You'll probably have heard during the pandemic of a disease's R0 number, which is the basic reproduction rate. So that's that's what that is. So that's why I'm working on right at the moment. So I'm just writing that up this weekend. Yeah, more writing to do. Um, I'm also looking at developing risk models that run decentralized on people's phones so that no kind of personal data needs to be sent centrally to a health authority as well. Um, and also to provide people with a kind of tailored risk information and tailored advice to themselves as well. And the idea behind that is it will allow people to manage their own risk rather than to go from, yes, you're free, go wherever you want, to actually you can't go anywhere, stay at home. You know, there needs to be kind of a middle ground. So I'm looking at how we do that. So to try and keep people safe while society can still, you know, basically function. Um, and also keeping people who have got you know, particular conditions that mean they are more vulnerable than others, trying to keep them safe as well. Uh, but all that work will hopefully lead to having the information necessary to maintain an early warning system for outbreaks and future pandemics so that we don't have this mad rush when something happens. Uh, and so that we have a wider range of kind of less drastic tools for future diseases and pathogens. Um, and I'll be publishing journal articles in the next year, hopefully. So I can't talk about this every week because the way the scientific process works you've kind of got to document um, this and publish it as a journal article as your first place of publication because it needs to be peer reviewed. So I'll publish those, but once they're published, I'll kind of give a kind of high level gist of it because it will be in kind of science ease, those journal articles a bit as well. Um, but if you'd like to hear more about computational epidemiology, not that you would, <laughs> but if you do, if that's what floats your boat, then do let me know in the comments below. Um, I can try and explain some of the terms if, you, if they're confusing, which they often are. Uh, <clears throat> over the next few months, so what I'll be also working on is developing risk formulas for kind of different pathogens and applying uh, machine learning algorithms to help spot the most vulnerable patients. So this will be primarily around kind of HIV and hepatitis though. So they're more bloodborne viruses um, rather than kind of airborne. <coughs> Excuse me. That's not COVID by the way, that's just a dry mouth. Um, but that work on HIV and hepatitis will hopefully give me ideas that we can apply to other pathogens too. Um, but it also means that we're doing work that's helping people right now rather than some future pandemic. So that's always, you know, great to work on as well. Um, as you can also see, I've been trying to kind of complete my office space with various levels of success and tidiness. It doesn't need a quick retidy and finishing, but I'm nearly there now. So I'll probably, my first video will probably be about this studio environment that I've set up and what I've set it up, why I've set it up and how I've done it. Um, and also how to avoid some of the mistakes I've made while I was doing it. <laughs> Uh, I also have a few projects kicking around in here, which is great. So I've got like a cheap 3D printers. I've got kind of small, cheap compute clusters and Kubernetes DevOps things that I've been doing as well. So I can do standalone videos on those things. I'm also very aware some people have already asked for vlogs on my creating a database from scratch in C++ series. So I'll be revisiting that uh, partially because I think it might be useful for my PhD, but partially also I think it might be useful for work. Um, but having another open source database out there is always a good thing. So I'll look at doing that as well. Um, I also know I owe the HiQ community, and that's the operating system, not the poems. Um, I owe them quite a lot uh, on the C++ ID uh, for the operating system or to hand it over to a new contributor. So if anyone from that community is watching, I am fully aware of that. I'll definitely look into doing this very soon. I'll also put a link to all the great projects and groups that I've mentioned in this video in the description. So do check out all these great teams and the amazing work they are doing. Uh, but that's kind of all my updates for now, though. So happy new year. Um, I hope you have a great start 2023 and do subscribe and like this video and let me know what you want to hear more about in 2023.